Hi, it's Jian from Melbourne Food Forest and welcome to part two of our growing epic rainbow corn masterclass. In part two, we're going to show you what to do with your corn seedlings, how to plant them out, how far to space them, and most importantly, how to prepare your soil so you can get that all important epic corn harvest. We'll also show you some other tips and tricks like what to do if they're already big and bursting out of their pots, but you've got nowhere to plant them, which is something that happens so often for us in our garden. As you can see, it's just crammed full of produce at the moment. In part one of our corn masterclass series, we showed you how to plant out your corn seeds into recycled punnets that are made from toilet rolls. And after a few weeks, your corn would have sprouted. So just checking on our corn seedlings, look how much they've grown. So you can see this variety forms these stunning red stems really pretty and you can see with their root zone starting to little roots poke out so some people are always worried about this cardboard and whether it could break down yes it does it doesn't hold the roots back at all and we know it's due for water because looking at the soil on top looking at the soil on top and you poke your finger in a few centimeters down and it's feeling really dry one of the benefits of growing in the trays is that you can do what we call bottom watering so I'll show you what that means so you tip the water into the tray rather than individually into each of the punnets Usually I fill it up to about one to two centimeters in the tray and let the corn seedlings absorb whatever water they can in about half a day and tip out the rest. But I find with that amount, they'll usually absorb that with no issues. And bottom watering is a great way to water because it reduces fungal diseases. So you're not splashing water up onto the leaves and it promotes strong root growth because in order to access the water the plant's roots have to grow downwards and so it produces really long straight roots which makes the corn plants once planted out more drought tolerant they'll have a long tap root and they'll be able to draw into the water lower in the bed and so you can see that water that i put in the bottom watering so this is 10 minutes later and it's already taken most of it up actually so I may need to add more because it's still looking pretty dry so I'm gonna add a little bit more maybe another centimeter and see how that goes it has been quite sunny and they're loving it before planting out, you'll also want to do a process of what we call hardening off. This takes usually one or two weeks, and what that means is gradually acclimatizing your corn seedlings to the real world. The wind, the cold, the rain, direct sunshine. So wherever you've had it, whether it's been inside at night or in the greenhouse, you'll want to gradually bring your corn seedlings outside every day for a few extra hours. So if it's still cool, you could literally leave it outside 
during the daylight hours for the whole day whereas if it's a really hot day you'll want to gradually increase those hours from one hour to three hours to five hours by the end of the week and this just makes sure that they're really tough and you're not planting a seedling that's never been in the outdoors straight into the soil because they're, they're going to go into shock looking at this tray which has been growing for um, about three to four weeks now I'm pretty happy with them look how tall they are they've had a little bit of snail damage a little bit of nibbling here and there as you can tell but overall they're looking really healthy and strong the color is a little pale which tells me that they're probably outgrowing the nutrition that's available in the little pot and so they need more nitrogen because corn is a very heavy feeder so you could have topped up with um, a liquid organic fertilizer when you're watering as well but this well and truly tells me that these are ready to go into the ground okay so let's pull one out and see what's going on so just be delicate as the roots will be quite long and extensive by now so looking at this look at this beautiful long pink roots and that's the advantage of bottom watering because it encourages roots to grow downwards and deep which is exactly what we want because that going to give plants better drought tolerance because their roots can tap into deeper reserves of water in the soil and also through use of these little biodegradable tubes they encourage again the roots to grow straight and downwards so that's looking really good and to me suggesting just now is just the right time to plant out it's not root bound and it's got an extensive root system so as you can see around me bed space is still incredibly scarce we're just chocker blocks with spring produce and there's just not an inch of space really for corn I mean I'm gonna find somewhere to squeeze these in but if you're in the same situation as me and you've just got no bed space one trick that I do have is you can pot these up into slightly bigger pots like this just pop it straight in and fill it with your good quality potting mix and some manure at this stage as well because they're really ready to take off um, so you can plant it in here and pot it up and that will stay in here happily for another few weeks up to a month if you continue to um, if you give it plenty of fertilizer and, and or give it liquid feeds and this will buy you another month of time and you might have some spare bed space by then now you might be wondering well why didn't we plant straight into these to begin with well, for reason, there's a few reasons for that. They're much bigger and they take up a lot of space. And like with your indoor plants, if you plant a small seed into this huge pocket of soil before it's even got any roots, and it probably won't have a root ball of this size, maybe for a few months, that's gonna lead to a higher likelihood of um, overwatering and rot. So what we really want in terms of our punnets is to have a punnet that roughly matches the size of our seedlings roots and a little bit larger but not humongously larger like this if we planted the seeds straight into this it likely rot now another thing i wanted to talk to you about before we plant out is how corn's pollination works now corn is generally thought of as a wind pollinated plant and you can hand pollinate and i'll talk about that later too but in nature corn is pollinated by the wind so that's why in part one i recommended planting at least nine seedlings so you can get a block of three by three and help with wind pollination and what that means also is if you want to grow more than one variety of corn there's a high likelihood that they'll cross pollinate in a standard backyard and unlike with other plants like say tomatoes or chilies if they cross pollinate you probably won't even know the difference so with a tomato if it's been cross pollinated the fruit will still look like the fruit that it's meant to be on that plant so if a purple Cherokee even if it's cross pollinated with a sweetie will still look like a purple Cherokee and taste the same but the seeds inside will be a hybrid seed but you won't be able to tell the difference because we're mostly eating it for the fruit and the seeds are just tomato seeds corn on the other hand we eat corn for the seeds themselves so we're eating the corn cob or the kernel and that's the seeds of the corn so if corn is cross-pollinated with another variety that's planted close by you're actually going to get kernels that aren't true to type so if you planted a seed uh, if you planted a sweet corn next to a glass gem corn you might get pollination and you'll 
both of them will be hybrid so it won't taste like a sweet corn and it won't look like a glass gem corn there'll be some both will be some murky in between and so you won't get the best characteristics that you're looking for from both of them so how do you avoid corn cross-pollinating well the easiest and most obvious solution is to plant one variety of corn each season Unless your neighbor's got some extensive corn crop going, you won't get any cross-pollination because you've just got one variety in your yard. If you're greedy like us, we love our corn and each year we plant three different varieties of corn but yet still manage to keep them pure and avoid cross-pollination. And we've got a few tips and tricks for that. The first tip I have is plant them as far apart as you can. So ideally, if you've got room in the front yard and in the backyard, plant corn in these two different spots and because they're separated by your house they're not in line of sight of each other so the wind won't be able to blow the pollen from one variety to another so having a big physical barrier like a shed or a big tree or planting them in opposite ends of your backyard if that's all you've got are going to help you avoid two varieties crossing now if that's not possible because space is really limited where you are then the other option is to stagger the planting of your corn seeds. So what we've got here is this variety was planted about four weeks ago. And this is the Oaxacan green corn that you saw in part one. Now the second variety of corn that we want to grow this season is the glutinous white corn, which is one of our favorite savory eating corns, fresh eating corn. We plant a few different varieties of corn because they all have different uses. So the Oaxacan green corn is fantastic for making corn flour and tortillas. This white glutinous corn is a savory eating corn and we'll also plant a sweet corn variety. This was planted about three weeks after the Oaxacan green corn. So you can see it's already sprouted up so much more and quicker because the weather's warming up right now. And so by staggering the planting of your corn seeds, and I recommend at least three weeks apart, what that will mean is by the time that the earliest planted variety, this Oaxacan green corn, start to produce its reproductive bits, which are the tassels and the silks, the other variety will still be immature because it's three weeks behind and it won't have its reproductive organs. So there's no way that this variety could cross pollinate that one. By staggering your varieties, we can get three varieties crammed in to our yard and also avoid cross-pollination. So planting them all three weeks apart. You do have to be careful though, especially with the, the latest planted corn. You don't want to plant too late in the season because corn still needs very hot weather in order to mature and germinate. So you do need to get your first variety started early, probably late winter or spring, and then do your next variety three weeks later and the following variety maybe late spring, early summer. Where should you plant your corn and how do you choose the best site for your corn? Well, for us really, it's the first consideration is where do we actually have space available at the start of spring? And for us, it's in this bed because we're about to pull out these turnips which are mature and ready for harvest. Corn is such a tall growing plant. It can grow way taller than me, so um, sometimes up to two meters tall. You don't want your corn to be shading out your other plants. So in the southern hemisphere, our sun comes from the north. So planting the corn on your southern border means that your other plants will still get plenty of sun while your corn can lap up the sun in the back southern corner. So the third thing to think about when planting your corn and the location is perhaps planting it after a vegetable that's not a super hungry feeder. So I generally wouldn't plant corn straight after a brassica crop because corn being a type of grass is a really nutrient hungry plant and so is broccoli and if you do you're gonna just have to top up your soil with more nutrients so by planting after a root crop like turnips or carrots I consider them medium feeders so they don't draw too much out of the soil and as you can see here the soil still really rich and black it tells me there's high organic matter so I won't have to amend this massively with lots of compost but I'll show you what we're gonna do to make sure it's ready for our corn planting so I'm going to plant as much of the corn as I can fit in this bed because this is really the only bed space we have available right now. And this currently houses some lovely turnips that are pretty mature and close to going to seed. So I'm going to pull all of these out to make room for our corn.
pile of turnips out and we're going to make many good meals with that. Tops for stir fries and pestos and the bottoms um, into soups and stews. And you can see that planting corn after a root crop. The root crop has really softened and loosened the soil. You can see that's got lots of worms in it. The worms everywhere. And the soil is really loose. And how do I know that? If I stick my hand in, I can put it straight in to the bottom with no effort at all. I don't even need a metal spade. It's like a little bit of a grub to the chooks. Um, so the soil is nice and friable and feeling around I can see that it's still got good organic matter. Preparing the soil for corn. Corn, which is a grass, is one of the hungriest plants that we grow in our garden. It's almost impossible to over fertilize it with organic fertilizers when it's young because it needs so much nutrition. You can skimp on the water a bit I found but don't skimp on the food. In my experience, the best soils are the ones that are diverse. The more different materials you can incorporate into it, the better the outcomes that you get. So, use what you have on hand, and we're gonna show you what we use, because that's what we have available. So the first one that I think is really important, especially in Australia, because we live on some of the oldest and most depleted soils in the world, is rock dust. Rock dust is, so we buy that in bulk and then store it in these tubs, but it contains a range of trace elements and minerals which are so important to have in your vegetables because if they're in the soil, the vegetables will take it up and you will be able to enjoy them in your food too and it'll help you improve your health. So this will make help plants grow much stronger and healthier in depleted soils. If you live in an area with much richer soils, you probably won't need to use it. Now the next ingredient for your soil that I recommend is worm castings. So these come from our four worm farms and are a powerhouse of nutrients. We put blended eggshells in there so it's packed with calcium and all sorts of other nutrients that are bioavailable to your plants because the worms make them available. So this is just so rich and we'll put a little pocket of that into the planting hole for every corn seedling when we plant. The next ingredient for your soil is chicken manure. You can get this in a pellet form or you can use the chicken manure from your chickens assuming it's well rotted. You don't want to use fresh manure because that's too rich and will burn your seedlings. We also add blood and bone. So this is not essential, it's just that we've had this packet that we bought about five years ago still lying around so we sprinkle some every time we plant. All of these use what you have available. They all add something different to the mix and none are absolutely essential other than I would say homemade compost which is what we're going to top up this bed with. Another way to improve your soil is to plant a nitrogen fixing crop like over the winter months plant either raw beans or peas into the spot where you're going to plant your corn. Once they're spent chop it down and dig into the soil. This becomes a green manure which replenishes your soil with all the nutrients that it needs. To prepare for planting, I'm just going to pull out all these self-seeded parsley and transplant them somewhere else. So what I've got here is a mix of homemade compost on this side. You can see there's lots of eggshells and it's so rich. And on this side we've got some well rotted gentle manure and what you want for that is either cow, sheep or horse. Now because this soil is already pretty rich I won't need to do too much amending but if your soil is more depleted or you've planted a hungry feeder before then like broccoli or cauliflower you'll need to add more organic matter to your soil. But have a feel around and have a look like how dark and spongy does it feel and that tells you how much organic matter you need to add. Add this in and mix it through and we'll also add in our other amendments like rock dust. Now I'm just going to sprinkle these on. If you're more scientific you could measure out how many square meters and how much you need to sprinkle but I like to go by feel. So rock dust, just a light sprinkling across the soil, chicken manure, 
generous few handfuls across this area. And here's our little seedlings and let's talk about spacing. So as we mentioned before, corn is wind pollinated. So you need them close enough together that the wind can blow the pollen from the tassels of one corn onto the silks, which are the little silky bits as the name sounds, on the cobs of the corn below it. So the tassels will grow at the top of the plant and the cobs will form along the stem and you need the pollen from the top to be blown onto here or from another plant's pollen to be blown down to here. So the closest I've spaced corn and which you can totally do is 10 centimeters. When you plant corn very closely or any plant very closely, what that means is they're going to be competing with each other a lot more for nutrients, for water, for space and light. And if you're going to plant them closely, you will just need to water and feed a lot more throughout the season. So it's a bit more work, but sometimes we don't have the choice if we don't have the space. It can totally be done and you can still grow awesome corn. You just need to be a little bit more attentive to it than if you planted them further apart. So planting corn much closer together will aid pollination because they're all crammed in and the pollen is going to be getting everywhere all over the silks. That's one advantage and it means you can get a much higher yield from a small area but it is a little bit more work because it's intensive farming in a small block of land. In this space here, and you could measure it out, but through that your soil and I'm just going to make little holes for where I think I'm going to plant it. So I'm going about 15 centimetres apart and I'm going to try and get three rows in of three corn for nine. Make your holes where you think the corn might go. I'm going to have three blocks of three so that's nine corn in this bed and so it's actually a really tiny spot and if you think about that each corn will likely produce three to four cobs and so with nine corn here I'd be expecting around 30 cobs in this tiny little space so it's actually quite efficient and to be honest corn is not a difficult plant to grow but a lot of people are put off by it but you can see that it even though it grows really tall, it doesn't actually take up much space down here at all. So I've got 12 healthy seedlings because I planted extra as a backup and I'm going to pick my best ones to plant into the soil. So pick the ones that look the healthiest, the tallest and the biggest. So because of the way the sun works, again coming from the north, put your biggest seedlings in your back row so they don't shade out the smaller ones in the front. Look at the really long root on this one. You want to try and keep these intact as much as possible when, you, when you're planting. And a little slug here as well. Just going to squish that and add it to the soil as nutrients. So I've actually got seven left, seven backup plants, and you can plant these in another part of the garden, or maybe once these lettuces go in the bed, we'll pop the rest of them in there, or you can give them away to a friend as a gift. So let's plant them in. We pop a handful of worm castings at the bottom of every seedling, because this gives it a packet of nutrients in which to grow. When the Aztecs planted corn, they would bury a fish head or fish bones under every single corn plant and that gives it the nutrients to feed it over the whole season. So we're trying to replicate that a little bit with our worm castings. But if you had a fish head or fish bones or other bones by all means go and bury them under your plant. And plant it so that the top of the corn is roughly in level with the soil but a little bit lower because soil levels do sink over time. So another pocket of worm castings. Now be 
because our soil is so soft, I can just plant this in with my hands. But if your soil is much firmer or clay-like soil, you'll probably need a trowel to dig your hole. press each seedling in firmly into the soil so that there's minimizing any air pockets and that they're standing up nice and straight. And at this point we should water it in well. You can use some seaweed solution in it as well which helps to minimize transplant shock and get your corn seedlings settled into the soil much better. Add whatever mulch you have on hand. I always say the best source of mulch is what you have available locally and what's sustainable. So we use coffee husks quite extensively in our garden. As you'll see, our garden looks like it's covered in gold. And this is coffee husks, which is the outer shell of the coffee bean. And we have a lot of this in ready supply, so I can just pull that on and keep the soil really moist. Okay, now that your corn seedlings are planted out, you want to protect them from pests if you have a lot around your area. And snails and slugs do like to attack. Given that these are a really big size, they'll probably withstand a bit of a nibble from snails and slugs. But if you wanted to, or if your seedlings are a bit smaller, you can protect them with a homemade cloche out of milk cartons. Or you can get these purpose-made plastic cloches that you can put over them. But because we've raised them so big and healthy, they're going to be pretty resilient and I think they're going to be fine against most pest attacks. So there you have it, that's part two of our corn masterclass. So we're ready now to watch our little seedlings flourish. So join us for part three, where we'll show you how to keep your corn seedlings growing strongly and healthily during the season, including pollination tips and tricks.